your house. Good boy. Okay, step one, slide open slider if it's not already open. Step two, be patient. Step three, close slider. Step one, here. Here. Sometimes likes to go over there, check shit out. But he's being nice and chill, and he knows that we always take a minute. Hmm. We invite him to be close when he's nice and calm. Good boy. As long as you didn't eat poop, then you can give me kisses, yes. Now if you go too long or you get him too excited, he would probably jump up on your lap a little bit. Sometimes he rolls over on his back and gives you belly. But we always make the fact that he came and that he listened a rewarding experience. When we're done, grab the collar with your fingertips. In your house, here, nudge it a little bit. Good boy, praise him for doing a good job on his own. side. Of course you probably have somebody in there already. Didn't come up on his own, so come down. Come. Good boy. Sometimes he doesn't always want to come. So you see how I nudged the door a little bit? That means he can't come out here. And then we do the same thing on this side. Thank you for listening. Good boy. Stay. And then if he still doesn't come, and he's back there and he doesn't listen, sometimes he goes around the corner there a little bit. But you could see in his eyes, you could see when he's not, then you go, no, come. And he'll come, and if he doesn't, you can take a chain, toss it through the hole. And that's it. Chloe, here. Clear for Chloe. One moment. She pokey. Again, same thing. A lot of times she goes right in. Depends if she's thirsty or not. Good girl. Give her a minute of affection. You want to give the camera kisses? Okay. Here. Nope. In your house. Come here. Good. In your house. Good girl. And then we go around. She's drinking water now, so if you're on the other side, Calling her, just be patient. Come over here. Squat down. Good girl. Stay. And then we could do the same thing on this side. Thank you. Good girl. Good. Stay. And then she 
she can get a piece of kibble. Not lure her through with it, but when she does what she's supposed to, she can have a reward. If you're going in there waving food in front of her face, trying to get her to come, she's going to stay back there all the time. You're just training them to not come forward unless you have food, unless you're bribing them. But I'm not bribing her. She did what she's supposed to, so she gets a reward. Good girl. And now she's most likely going to do that every time. And the same goes with Tyson. Hush! Same goes with Tyson. Yeah, same goes in most of them, really. If you're going to use food, don't use the lungs and whatever that is, because some of these guys have been throwing up and it's throwing up and having the shits. It's too much crap. They're on specific diets, so we don't want to use that. They'll do it for a piece of kibble. Huh. You hush. Now I'm assuming those are mostly the ones that you're going to have trouble with. Maybe this guy sometimes. So I shall just mess with him. We'll make him think he's going to go out. Say so think he's going to want to come back. Come. Good. You see, he didn't want to come back, but he listened. And now if I wanted to, I can give him a piece of kibble. Good boy. So maybe it's different after somebody else handles the dog <clears throat> and they come back and, you know, who knows, maybe they got the dog all excited. So here comes Colby back from her walk. So maybe she won't want to listen now. She's going to drink some water. Again, just be patient. No need to rush. We're not in a hurry to get out of here. It's not about getting things done as quick as possible. It's about doing what's best for them. So there she stops and pauses. Kobe, come. Good girl. Good girl. And what's she looking for? She's looking for the kibble. Sit. Good girl. Place. Nope. Okay, so again. Somebody else handled the dog. Dog's coming back. Maybe he's all excited. You're probably going to see the same thing. He's going to want to drink water. Nope. Came right in. Good boy. Chose to drink out of his bowl instead. Good job. Good. I, I think there's a few different kinds of people that um, volunteer at a rescue shelter. There's the, there's the ones that feel bad for an animal who's homeless. You know, they think it's homeless. Not like a homeless person, but it's without love or, or without things that it needs, like coziness, like a bed or a blanket or affection, and they come to deliver those things without really understanding what the animal really needs. Um, <clears throat> there are those that also come because it makes them feel good, because they want a certain amount of affection or attention from an animal. And so they, they seek that attention. And then there are also those who come because they understand more what a, what a dog needs and they want to deliver that. Uh, I think the third one is the most valuable. Although there's value in all of them. And you can't really expect all people to have it in them to give what an animal needs. I think some people feel bad doing it. Like for instance, you know, telling a dog no, or correcting a dog, or using a certain kind of collar, 
you know, makes people feel bad. Um, <clears throat> but you can tell a lot by what the animal tells you about how it feels about something. Um, now, if, if we're, we're discussing now uh, the previous videos that, that we just saw, uh, some people are having trouble getting those handful of dogs to come forward in their kennel. And we, what we don't want to do is go into the kennel and try to force the dog to go in. So you don't want somebody to go into that back side of the kennel, grab them by the collar, and push them through. You don't want to force a dog to do something it doesn't want to do because what happens is eventually they'll get tired of it. And when you go to grab onto their collar and force them, turn at you like that, maybe mouth you, maybe nip you. Um, and then eventually they'll see the hand coming toward them and they'll turn in, in a defensive way. And what that does is really trains them to become defensive towards approach towards the hand coming out. Um, so, and if you didn't notice the way I did it, there's a few things that you could do. And I guide them in the same way a mother teaches her puppy to do something to walk downstairs or upstairs. They put their mouth over their neck and they just guide them. They don't force them. They go like, you know, it's okay. You, you could do this. I'll even show you how to do it. Uh, and they're calm about it. They're not frustrated. They're not angry. <clears throat> um, so the, the way I approach dogs is very matter of fact. And they can make a mistake, like Colby made a mistake. I said to go in her house. She chose to walk away down the hallway. No, come back. She sat down. That's not what I asked you to do. Come. And then she did. So I didn't get mad at her. I mean, of course she's going to make a mistake. She's a dog. It's like, you know, three-year-olds. They're going to make mistakes. That's how they learn. But repetitive behavior on your part will teach them to be more consistent in the way they behave. So if you notice the second time, the walker brought her back, and she came right forward, and she looked She looked right at the table, because she knew that's where the food was, and sat. So of course she gets the kibble. So, I mean, that's one, one reason that dogs will listen. Um, Obviously, sometimes they won't, and sometimes it's just the fact that the concrete is cool to the touch, and when they come in and they're hot, they want to just sprawl out on that concrete, and you're like, come on. And they're like, I don't really want to. This is nice. Um, so, like I said, you can, you can take the chain, throw it through the hole to kind of startle them, and how you do that is, like Tyson, for instance, he'll usually, he'll usually look at you, and then he'll look, and he, you know, like he's going to start walking away and ignore you. As soon as he looks away, no, I said come. And then he'll look back, and if he doesn't, if he starts to walk away, affirm no, and throw the chain through the hole, so it startles him. Nine out of ten times he's going to come up. And as far as Fenway goes, he, I, I don't know if he is different for you guys, but he's always very consistent. Um, for him, he drinks sometimes for a minute straight. He comes in from playing or from a walk or whatever, and he's hot and he's tired. And that's because, you know, like I asked you to do, because he gives you issues coming in with hold water. When he's really tired, him or Alfie, when they're really tired, they can't really sit there and aggressively chew on the ball because they have to take a break to pant, to cool off. So they have to take in that air and they can't do it while they're aggressively chewing or while they have a ball in their mouth. And it's easier to get them to drop it, uh, especially when they're really hot and tired. And it's easier to get them in because they know that they need and want water and they know that's where it is. So basically you letting them in is you giving them what they need. So to go in there and then say, hey, no, you can't have that water. I want you to go in the hole or try to be like forceful or domineering in some way. 
it's not going to work because you just basically gave them permission to have that resource. So the best thing to do is, well, me, I have to go around, so you go around, open the slider, let him finish. If he's taking his time, hook the slider, go do something else for a minute. When you come back, he's already going to be probably laying in his bed. Close it, move on to the next dog. You don't have to, to rush. I mean, if you take your time and you take 30 seconds to, you know, congratulate a dog for doing the right thing and give him some, some attention when he's calm, then it's really, what, going to add five minutes to your day? Maybe ten minutes? So you'll get out five or ten minutes later? Not a big deal. But it's so worth it, especially in the long run, two or three weeks down the road, you're going to actually have an easier time because instead of fighting with them, they're going to listen so your day will actually go quicker. Okay, so... <clears throat> those different types of people, what makes a huge difference is the way they're managed and handled all around, in and out of the kennel. Uh, if you noticed, I only accept calmness from them. Uh, when, when they're in the kennel, like you saw Rocky start to get just a little bit anxious. No, I made him go in his place, stay. And it's not always that easy, especially when they're new. Because he starts going, then Samson starts going, or vice versa. Then Chloe joins in, then Tacoma. Before you know it, the whole kennel's going, and they're howling, and it's just jumping around, whacking their tails on the wall, making a mess, crapping in it, jumping around in their crap. Not a pleasant experience. Not for them, that's for sure. So for those that would say, well, you're, you're strict or you're mean, maybe it seems that way, and maybe you think that the dog seems sad because it's submitting to what I'm asking it to do. But if you've ever seen a completely stressed out kennel, you'll, you'll understand. I mean, I've gone to some pounds where... There's 40, 50 dogs directly across from each other, and it does not ever stop, day and night. And they just become insane from it, aggressive. You know, a lot of these dogs that you see in the pounds, well, they're, they're not adoptable because they're people aggressive or dog aggressive. They probably didn't come in that way. They probably became that way from the extreme stress. I mean, all you have to do is spend 10 minutes in a kennel, and you want to freaking pull your hair out. When it's like that, I mean, I just feel like oh, so bad. I wish I had the authority to go in there and take control of it because it's just very stressful. Um, so, how you approach, you notice I speak a lot in commands. I soften up when they when they do what I've asked them to, and I give them softness and kindness and gentleness. And then, when that's done because they did what they were told, and they're calm, and the reward is done, I go back to here, house, place, whatever, back to a command. And I typically leave it with a command, or a, you know, good, good boy, whatever. If you create excitement, I mean, it's really easy. My dogs are sitting over here right now in their, in their places, and all I really have to do is look at them. I can look at them and just start talking to them. And I'm talking to him. I'm talking to you guys still. He's just <laughs> and look what he does. Yeah. See, he gets up. See, he thinks that because I'm paying attention just by looking at him, that it's okay, you know, to be sitting his tail's wagging. It's okay for him to become excited. Yeah, he knows better than to just come up here, but I can invite him up here. Fuzzy, come here. Now the other one is never allowed up on here because she's got that real thick fur that, you know, just gets the stink under it and her fur sheds a lot and gets in my butt crack and I just don't want her on the furniture. But of course she perked up because I allowed him to do something and she also wants attention, which is fine. And he's licking his junk, so I, mean, I don't want you on here doing that. <laughs> So when I'm done having him on here, I can tell him, off.
Place. Nope. Place. And of course, he's reluctant. Do I have to? But you can hear him. <sighs> he's in his place. He's not sad. And she's not sad that she doesn't get on the furniture. She, that, to her, that's just the way it is. That's just what she's used to. It doesn't, it doesn't really bother her, make her jealous. She never attempts to come up on the furniture. In fact, if I ever do invite her on, she's actually reluctant to come on because she knows she's not supposed to. So sometimes I really have to coax her out and she'll go like her front paws and half of her body on. It's okay, come on, you know, and she creeps her way on and feels like, I don't know, I'm not supposed to be here. And she'll stay for a minute and be like, oh, I gotta get off because it's, uh, it's uncomfortable because she knows that typically that wouldn't please me. So, I mean, ideally that's what they want. Especially if you approach them with the fact they're a dog. They're not a stuffed animal. You know, you got to talk to them like a dog. you got to treat them like a dog. You can't freely give them affection. You can't freely allow them to do things, whatever they want. If you, if you look at... If you look at Samson and Rocky, their problem is just flat out bad behavior. Just bad behavior. They were taught all the wrong things. And so, you've probably seen it. Man, you open the door, they barge through, wheels spinning, sliding into the wall. They're so excited to get out. Even if you try to calm them down before coming out. So the only way to get them out calmly, really is to leash them up and guide them out and show them, correct them when they, when they go too crazy. When I first started putting them together, what a pain, you know, to, together to play. I'd have to guide one out calmly, teach him down and stay while I go get the other one. Now expecting him to stay, that was tough. Then I gotta bring the other one out and I gotta get them both to down stay until they're just like, they forget. They forget that they're outside. They forget where they are. Then I kind of just take the leashes and I don't say a word and I just start walking them around and I show them that this is what we're doing. We're just walking around calmly. We're just gonna go walk around the yard and smell stuff. And then I just kind of let go and I keep walking with them. And eventually, you know, they start playing. They get a little crazy. But if you let them both out and you let them both tear through the building and out the door, they're going to go at each other so hard that they're going to end up correcting each other and then fighting. And <clears throat> a lot of it is that they were encouraged to be excited by people saying, Oh, you want to go for a walk? Come on, let's go for a walk. I got your leash. And they're jumping up and down, jumping up and down. Put the leash on them. Get them outside. Squirrel, bug, I mean, everything just makes them crazy. They want to go after everything, explore everything, just, you know, like Doug the dog. Squirrel! You know, just very easily distracted. In my opinion, the worst kind of dogs to work with. <coughs> Smart. Like, they get it when you show them, but you have to show them every time. You have to always be consistent, otherwise... You, know, you let them go one inch, they're going to take it ten miles. That's just their nature. Um, but most dogs, you know, mo most dogs will, you know, like you got Tyson, you got Colby. Uh, sometimes Tacoma can just be very excitable and it doesn't take much to excite them. And it's silly things like letting them on your lap or just the way you talk to them or I see I don't ever encourage that. I don't ever allow them to jump on me on my lap to get oh excuse me, to get pet. I pretty much always do it the way I did it with them. It's just come down to their level, invite them to come to me, invite them for affection. And if they do start jumping on me, no, and I'll nudge them off or I'll you know, kinda of shove them off with my arm. And when they calm down I'll continue petting again, but I'm not going to, like, push them off and then pet them while they're still excited because it defeats the purpose. Um, so how you present yourself 
really has more to do with it than will they listen to you based on what I've said or what I've demonstrated in, in the video. They do that for me because of the way I present myself all the time. So I can't, you can't expect them to, you know, like if, if you're going to treat them as a playmate or a buddy, you can't expect them to all of a sudden listen to you when you need to be serious. And so play is always structured. That's why it's always sit, look, make eye contact, throw the ball, come, bring the ball back, drop, back away from the ball, sit, look. You know, it's structure to it. It's not just a free-for-all. Or just letting a dog out and then standing in a group of people talking while the dog does whatever it wants, goes over and barks at the other dogs walking you know, out the driveway or, or whatever, if they're just allowed to do whatever they want, they're going to be more reluctant to go back in. you got to notice, you probably have noticed, in the kennel environment, dogs, when they start to get stressed out, have a need to want to control things. So, let's say you're outside in the yard, you got Chloe, you got Samson, and somebody's getting a dog out of the kennel and the dog in the kennel starts barking what do they do? they get up, they start pacing back and forth along the garage doors behind them they want to get in there and they want to control that dog who's, who's basically acting up and that need to want to control that you know sort of dominance is, is uh, actually more stressful and I stop that. I, I, I put a stop to that quickly because I don't want to put them back in there in that state of mind. If I put them back in the kennel in that state of mind, they're going to be in the kennel. Who, who's barking? Don't bark! Don't bark! Stop barking! And they just bark back. And then it just becomes this like chain, chain reaction. So ideally, I know it's hard. I know it's not easy. You know, it takes a lot of work, especially initially. You want to encourage them to always be calm. As soon as you come in to feed, I mean, this is like, in the morning, I come in, and basically, the first thing I do is address it, because it gets to me as soon as I walk in the door. Of course, they hear me come in, so they all start barking. Then they, then they realize they're going to get fed, so they start barking even more. And then, someone's barking, so someone wants to bark at that one, because it's barking. And so I'm like, you know, putting my stuff down, getting my radio. And the first thing I do is flip on the light, open the door, and I pick out the worst one, which is usually Samson or probably Chloe, and I address them. Once the other dogs realize, oh, he's addressing us, they'll usually stop. But if you ignore it and you walk over to the table and you start flipping bowls or you just say, hey, no, and you don't actually do anything about it, they're not going to stop. And then what you end up doing is you end up feeding and encouraging that behavior because they weren't told to stop. They were in that state of mind. They got rewarded for it. And now they're probably going to probably do that all afternoon. <clears throat> Typically, once I get those calm, those dogs calm, from Sylvie to the left, I feed them first because you got Sylvie who can bark, you got Samson who goes in completely insane. You got Chloe who joins in and you know bounces back and forth with him. And then you have Rocky down the other end. But typically, once you stop Samson, Rocky stops. Once I feed from there to the left, the right half quiets down. And then I can, you know, especially with Sylvie and then Rocky. Once I get those two fed, everybody else typically quiets down. So then, after feeding them all, they all pretty much settle down, and the sliders go down, and they know that they're not going to get their slider open, and they're not going to go outside if they're jumping around barking in the kennel. I will not choose them. And so that's why when you see that I'm walking back and forth through the kennels, they're all like, pick me up being good, because they know that's what I want from them in order to get 
what they want. And they don't always get it, because obviously there's 18 of them right now, and only one of me. So they're not always going to get it, but they still have to make that effort, because they know that it's, it's not going to happen. So typically, from there, I'll start with Rocky, I'll get him out, and then I'll move to Samson. As long as they stayed calm for a while, and after they've gone out, they usually stay pretty relaxed for a couple hours. Once they get out, get fed, and get out initially, uh, to, you know, to go to the bathroom, um, they'll stay calm for a couple hours. And then usually, say it's like 9.30, you know, 10, usually by about 11.30, 12, around lunchtime, they're ready and they want to go out again. And they'll start to, to get more excited. And they get used to the schedule, so they know, you know, they know when, uh, pretty much when I'm done with everybody else and I'm going to start the cycle over. And they typically know that that's the more exciting time to go out because that's usually the time where they get more time out or they have more activities because we either have something set up for them to do or they're going to play, you know, with each other or with somebody or whatever. Or they're going to go on a walk. So, um, yeah, <laughs> yeah it, can, it can be pretty stressful, but you have to manage it because it's definitely better for them in the long run. Even though it seems mean, it seems counterintuitive to what a lot of people think that uh, animal needs, you know, instead of being firm and no place, you know, whatever, instead of being commanding. That they should be soft and come here, do you want to go for what? Oh, poor baby. You know what I mean? Like that. They're going to walk all over you. They are going to walk all over you. So if you're too soft, if you're not, you know, commanding enough, um, if you're angry, if you're frustrated, or even if you're boring. God, if you're boring, they don't want to listen to you. They don't really want much to do with you. Um, you have to give them activities that they want. You have to give them things that they want in order for them to perform the way you you want them to. And that's that's the reward. Yes, there are corrections, but mostly mostly the correction is like I said just a stern disagreement even if they make a mistake very matter of fact sometimes it's more like energy body language um, and by energy the way you present yourself not frustrated not angry confident confident that the dog is gonna do what you ask it to even if it doesn't the end result, whether it's today, whether it's tomorrow, or next week, is going to be that the dog is going to do what you want it to. So knowing that, being confident, there's no really no reason to be frustrated or angry. Um, and I'll, I'll probably get more into a discussion on what dominance really is, because I think a lot of people um, are misled about what dominance is. Dominance, dominance is natural in the animal kingdom. It's natural amongst humans, uh, dogs, cats, whatever. All basically the same. It's all the same language. So they, they, they understand it. And dogs particularly tend to gravitate towards that and respect it. Just confidence. So, <clears throat> I think... A lot of the problem is because I'm still there sometimes when the next shift comes in. And so the dogs will go from this calm state to realizing that you've come in and that they're about to get fed again and it's about to be a party. It's about to be a free-for-all. All All the rules are about to go out the window. And the intensity level of the kennel, when other shifts come in, it's far more intense than the morning when you think it would be worse because in the morning they really got to go and they're probably really hungry. Um, But the intensity level is so much more because 
They know all these excited people are going to come in and give them tons of affection and take them on walks that don't have rules and bring them out in the yard with no rules and they get to do whatever they want, play these awesome games and nobody really follows like the training. And I'm not saying nobody, but definitely there are some. Uh, it's really tough because you try really hard to do what's best for them and it can just be turned around. That's why like if you're watching this and you have a family at home, and say it's a family of four, and two or three of you are following maybe what a trainer laid out for you, but one, maybe one person's like, ah, I've had dogs all my life, that's not necessary. The training won't work. Or, at the very least, it'll work for everybody but that one person. You know? But either way, it's not good for the dog, because if everybody's consistent, then when you have to bring your dog to the vet or to the babysitter, um, dog sitter, whatever, they're still going to have more of a consistent behavior. Like if I have somebody else walk Luna, for instance, she just is automatically programmed because of consistency just to stay at your side. Um, and, and she can go off leash anywhere. She can be allowed to move out and explore because when she's told to come back, she comes back. So. She's earned that. She had to earn that. It wasn't always that way. But she, she learned, and she earned that right. Um, <clears throat> not that Fuzzy can't do it. He really can. But since technically he's not mine, I'm not legally responsible for him. I always keep him on a leash, or at least on a flexi leash if we're up in the woods. That way, you know, I can call him back, and I don't have to, I don't have to worry about somebody approaching, you know, or a dog coming over the hill or something like that. <laughs> Lately it's been, I don't know what's up there. There were turkeys, foxes, cats, lots of like stray cats up there, or wild cats or whatever. Um, and, a, and a big white shepherd that creeps around, tries to follow us in the house. <laughs> yeah, so, I forgot where we were now. Uh, we're talking about the kennels and I don't know how we got there, but. Okay, so, yeah, basically, how you present yourself, how your crew presents yourself. I think if you follow what we've talked about in classes, we've had the lead class, we went over all this stuff. Um, you know, not everybody came, but if you follow what protocol is set forward, you're going to have an easier time. So if you don't follow it, you're going to have a harder time. It's completely up to you, really. But you have to keep in mind what's best for the, for the dog. And, and that is consistency.